Good evening and welcome to the COVID-19 update on Channels Television. I'm Millicent Walker. Here are some of the highlights this hour. President Mohamedou Buhari receives economic sustainability plan to create jobs and grow the economy following the coronavirus pandemic. Task Force in Niger State explains COVID-19 spendings as House of Assembly quizzes members of the team on 795 million Naira expenditure. And European Commission calls EU countries to remove borders within the bloc to allow citizens from outside the bloc return from July the 1st. Nigeria in West Africa is among the top five African countries with the highest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases on the continent. And that is after South Africa and, old, and Egypt, rather, in first and second place. Now, the country's numbers with the latest figures from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control is put at 13,873. 4,351 patients have been discharged across the country and 382 deaths recorded. Following the confirmation of 409 infections yesterday, the cases were recorded in Lagos, 201 of them, the FCT 85, Delta 22, Edo 16 cases, Nasarawa Bono and Kaduna, 14 cases each, Bochi 10, Rivers 9, 5 each in Enugu and Kano, 4 each in Ugu and Ondo states, while Bayelsa, Kebi and Plateau had two cases each. Regionally, Lagos retains the highest number in the country and the southwest with 6,266 cases. The FCT in the north central once again displaces Kano to emerge second highest with 1,097 cases, while Kano leads in the northwest with 1,025 cases. Edo State leads in the south-south with 478 cases. Bono still tops in the northeast with 385 cases. Eboy maintains 152 cases but leads in the southeast. The Nigeria government is giving nothing to chance as it comes up with a policy document that will aid the fast recovery of the economy amidst the coronavirus pandemic. The vice president, on behalf of the Economic Council, presented the Economic Sustainability Plan document to President Muhammadu Buhari today. Titled Bouncing Back, in a tweet, the vice president said it is a reflection of our beliefs that this plan will avert the impending economic headwinds and convert this crisis to victory for the Nigerian people. The committee was established by the president, chaired by the vice president, with some federal ministers as members. According to the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, the committee had worked on various ways to support each sector of the economy with clear interventions designed for the purpose of creating jobs, ensuring that businesses stay afloat during the tough times occasioned by COVID-19. In the meantime, President Buhari also participated in a virtual briefing from the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, uh, with the President Jean Cassie Bru, President of the ECOWAS Commission on Response and Eradication Process on COVID-19 at the Council Chamber State House, Abuja. President Mohamed Buhari was appointed as ECOWAS champion on COVID-19 in April when the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government in an extraordinary session uh, deliberated on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the sub-region. And as Nigerians prepare to celebrate Democracy Day tomorrow, the chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 says it should be celebrated in a solemn and reflective manner. According to Mr. Boss Mustafa at the briefing in Abuja today, the goal of every citizen should be staying alive and safe from COVID-19. He also says the Presidential Task Force has advanced in precision measures targeting high burden local government areas. We are pleased to inform you that His Excellency, Mr. President, held a video conference meeting with the President of the ECOWAS in his capacity as the ECOWAS champion for co the control of COVID-19. During the conference, matters pertaining to regional response to the pandemic were discussed. Specifically, 
Such matters include our common risk as a sub-region, the need for our collaboration in response, our interdependence, and Nigeria's role given our large population and the position of Mr. President as ECOWAS champion. Tomorrow, Nigeria will be celebrating Democracy Day. The Presidential Task Force urges that we should celebrate in solemn and reflective manner. We must ensure that our goal is to stay alive and remain COVID-19 free. Let the dead be a reminder of the realities of our times, the disruptive effects of COVID-19, the realization that we are faced with a new normal, and the necessity for us to individually and collectively prepare ourselves to come this pandemic. For the Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Hanire, the goal of the ministry is to have at least one molecular laboratory in each state of the federation while charging Nigerians to keep observing the safety guidelines. Dr. Hanire assures that there will be continuous sensitization programs for healthcare workers. Yesterday we had 409 new COVID-19 confirmed cases, which increased the total tally to 13,873. We have successfully treated and discharged 4,351 persons and unfortunately lost 382 Nigerians to this disease. Although these numbers are only creeping up compared to other countries and the case fatality rate hovers around 3%, we are concerned and at high alert. We have no room for complacency or overconfidence, and we need to be ready for any sudden shift in fortune. The Federal Ministry of Health, through the NCDC, is activating additional laboratories in Akwaibom, Jigawa, and Oyo states, which bring the total number of laboratories in the network to 33. More are being prepared as we work towards a target of at least one molecular laboratory per state. Optimization of some laboratories is also going on. We are planning for targeted community sensitization activities, especially in 20 high burden local government areas with sensitization workshops on infection prevention and control for healthcare workers, both in public and private hospitals. Uh, particularly here in the FCT. Let's now look at the trends in incidents, the vulnerabilities as a result of community transmission. We have Dr. Uluwatosi Akinshola, a lecturer, Epidemiology and Biostatistics, College of Medicine, University of Lagos. He joins us here in Lagos. Welcome to the program. Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. All right, first let's get your observation on the COVID-19 situation report in the last 24 hours. Well, in the last 24 hours, um, for the number of cases that we have, which have shown that uh, there were 409, well, it shows that um, we still need a lot of effort in uh, nipping this uh, COVID-19 to the board. More especially for this month of June, if you notice, since the past um, the presidential um, lift on the lockdown, we've seen that there has been a spike in the increase, especially in this June. So, really, we still need a lot of effort. The interesting thing when you look at the epidemic curve is we're seeing a zigzag, so to speak. But some people are wondering, I mean, are we moving back? Are we going forward? Uh, and how would this computer mean all the efforts being put in place by government authorities and the agencies responsible to keeping the numbers down? Well, yeah, with the zigzag statistics, it shows that um, you're still in there. We are still in there all day looking at the statistics. But when you have a zigzag, that means can the pattern is still undefined. So it shows that we still need to work with our protocols and see what we can do in bringing these uh, new incidences. So the zig that shows that uh, we are seeing that there in terms of the pattern of the new cases and the respected mortality cases too. 
So the Minister of Health said that um, we're seeing a lot more 60% asymptomatic cases and uh, this might explain um, why we're having this community transmission stage. So we're seeing um, a lot of people who look well and uh, hale and hardy, and meanwhile, they might be carriers of COVID-19. Explain that, um, you know, that particular stage and how susceptible um, a lot of people are at community level. Yes, you know, you're actually talking about uh, asymptomatic patients. That is the real problem you're having in tracking this disease condition. Because those who are asymptomatic. Who are these asymptomatic people? These are the people that actually, they have the virus, but they don't manifest the conditions. There's no manifestation of the condition among them. And actually, you can be healthy, just like an HIV patient. Are you getting what I'm saying? But the person can transfer the disease from one person to another. And initially, if you look at it, when they started, they actually started with, okay, for those who are positive patients, have an issue. That means two consecutive neg uh, negative tests. That's what it was started with. After, it was reviewed to one negative test. But now, from the guideline which um, we are given, we show that if between 10 to 14 days, I you what I'm saying, you're asymptomatic, you can be, you need to be released to go to. Because initially, the reason why they're still keeping the asymptomatic patients, because they feel that if you are asymptomatic, you have still at risk for your family members, for your relatives, and for your neighbors. But now, if you are still um, asymptomatic after 10 to 14 days uh, monitoring, so you are good to go. And by virtue of the fact that we are now having the scarcity of best spaces for new patients we are having, so that is more reason. And uh, in order for you to manage the situation very well, so that is it. So the real problem is that the asymptomatic people, because a person can actually have it, can, be look, can look healthy, but it can actually transfer it to one person to another. So, and if one, someone has it, I get what I'm saying, but it doesn't develop the, man, um, the manifestation of the disease doesn't show up. So, and uh, you may not know. And then that person can transfer the disease. So that's actually where the problem is. And you have a situation whereby we are having uh, people who are living in uh, face man, face to one room. So, so that's the problem we are having. If you look at perhaps the efforts of government, and that is easing the lockdown, um, and looking at our cases now um, as at today, would you say that government should review um, its measures, its efforts? To be sincere with you, I think it needs for government to review the lockdown. Because if you take example of some countries who have uh, actually used the lockdown, for example, look at South Korea and the Israel, who actually used the lockdown and asked their children to come back to school, so that they have a resurgence increase. And that's why they have to shut boundaries. So it's necessary for government to actually review the lockdown. Because with the way we are looking at the situation now, more especially for the beginning of this June, we have increased a spike in the number of new cases compared to when we have uh, the era of the, of the lockdown. And to, talking about interstate travel as well, uh, we still have a lot of people who are moving uh, even though uh, interstate travel ban is in place. Well, we can say actually interstate, inter, interstate uh, ban is in place, but to be honest with you, we find out that there have been some kind of, or how would I put it, the compromise on the, on the part of our security operatives, because there are some people who are traveling from interstate, but because of the way they have been managed. But now that they are even contemplating maybe they are going to use the interstate traveling, I think the government seems to have a second look at the matter. Because if they use the lockdown, we may likely have another resurgence, which may be very difficult for us to manage. All right, we'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Luato Sinyakishola, Lecturer of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, College of Medicine, Unilag. Thank you for joining us on the program. It's my pleasure. Thank you. We still have more on the COVID-19 updates when we return. Join us again. The United State House of Assembly has summoned members of the state's task force on COVID-19 to give account of their stewardship, especially with regards to how funds budgeted by the state government have been spent. According to the chairman of the task force and secretary to the state governor, Mr. Ahmed Metani, the sum of over 795 million naira has been spent, which includes the costs of palliatives, medical consumables, among others. The 300 million that you know was first approved was to take care of you know these uh, ambulances, issue of uh, you know water tankers, you know and supply and buses movements, 
and uh, some other forms of uh, logistics. So in total, when we add the second you know, palliative amount, 186 million, 15,000 Naira, to the 300 million, that would give us about 486 million, 15,000 Naira. Those are on the tax force activities and other related issues. It does not involve the medicals. The Lagos State Government has clarified its position on reopening of event centres, explaining that owners of such places across the state must register their facilities pending issuance of further directives by the State Governor. The Commissioner for Tourism, Arts and Culture, Mrs. Uzmat Akimbie Yusuf, made the clarification following media reports of event centres opening for operations. She explained that the State Government is yet to make any declaration on the date for reopening, adding that the Governor will make a pronouncement provided the event centers have met all laid down procedures, including registering under the Register to Open initiative of the state government. And as the world grapples with COVID-19, as we try to get our lives back to normal and minimize social disruptions, also the negative humanitarian consequences, we have Dr. Emil Korn. He gives us some idea of what we're uh, getting back into. She's also a public health physician. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Dr. Korn, we're hearing behavioral changes that we need to make. How best or how are we achieving this? What have you noticed as a public health physician in Lagos? Okay, so um, before you can have a behavioral change, you must have information. So a lot of awareness being created, especially by NCDC and all the health team, rapid response team, risk communication on precautionary measures. So you need to know first before you can act on it. So um, I, it's a bit worrisome that people are still doubting the existence of COVID-19. However, the risk communication is working hard to make sure that information gets to the right places so that people can um, do the things they're supposed to do the hand washing, especially the face mask thing. I see the way people use face masks. They turn it into chin mask. They turn it into just mouth mask beneath the nose, thrills, and all that. We call this a respiratory infection. So you know that the droplets can come through the nose, through the mouth. So by the time you put it on the chin, what exactly are you using that um, mask for? So we still have the lot, a lot of work to do emphasizing these things. I know um, behavioral change doesn't come all of a sudden. It's a gradual thing. It's not easy for somebody that has been used to just moving around, hugging people and all that. For you to now tell the person, no, don't hug don't shake, use hand sanitizers every time. And especially that face mask. Some, some people, especially with some cloth materials that are being used for the face mask, sometimes it could be a bit suffocating and people find it difficult to use. So these changes need time. But we need to still keep emphasizing, you know, positive reinforcement until we get there because COVID-19 is here and it's real and we really need to be precautionary. I wanted to get your thoughts on the new study that suggests diarrhea may actually play an important role in community transmission. Do you think that is also what we're witnessing here? Hey, well, um, it's still the respiratory tract that is more common as a means of um, transmission. However, we don't throw away that because... Um, People have come down with diarrhea. You know, initially when we had case definitions, we just had respiratory symptoms, cough, breathlessness, and all that. It was later that we had general body weakness and diarrhea. So um, in places where open defecation is still being practiced or improper sanitation, people dispose of, um, people go to use the toilet and they don't do the proper hand washing thing. You know, you need to wash the hand very well for a minimum of 20 seconds and all that. People just wash it in the jiffy. Some people even just use ordinary water without application of soap. Uh, you wonder how far that would go. So in place, in occasions like that, well, it can actually happen. But we still know that it's the respiratory tract that is the most common means of um, transmission. In terms of how we can curb this, do you think that we're still facing stigmatization? And this is on the part of people who stigmatize others who have survived, who have recovered, 
or perhaps um, health workers who are on the front lines? Yes, it's still happening. The stigmatization is there. And um, I really need for people to know that this um, disease, COVID-19, is a disease that respects no race, no gender, and even class. A big men have gotten it, poor men have gotten it, health workers have gotten it. And I wonder why some people still think it's not real. Why would a health worker pretend that he's ill and he has COVID-19, go to the isolation center and get treated and come out? After all, the, the people that are even stigmatizing, they are the ones that the COVID-19 uh, patients that have recovered should even be running away from. Because we've not gotten that um, confirmation that it confers live immunity. So if there's still that chance of reinfection, then they actually should be the ones running away from these people, stigmatizing them. So I'd advocate that please let us um, well, um, be careful. Let us accommodate others because this disease knows no difference, no race. It's a classless disease and it can affect anybody anywhere. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Emel Khan, public health physician. You understand it's your birthday today. Happy birthday to you. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Thank you very much. Brussels is calling on EU countries to open borders to travellers from outside the bloc from July the 1st. European countries have gradually begun to lift internal border restrictions put in place to stop the spread of COVID-19. According to the European Commission, international travel is key to tourism and business, and they want family and friends to reconnect. In the meantime, more than 2 million people in the U.S., have contracted the virus. Uh, this comes as the rest of the world continues to cope with the impact of the pandemic. Today, the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the United States topped 2 million, climbing even above it, according to the Center for Systems Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. The country's death toll also rose to nearly 113,000, with the hardest hit New York State reporting 30,680 deaths, according to the last count. German airline Lufthansa has said it will cut 22,000 jobs as it struggles to deal with the slump in air travel caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The carrier expects to have roughly 100 fewer aircrafts after the crisis and says half the job cuts will be in Germany. It hopes to agree the measures with unions by June 22. Germany is not alone as the coronavirus pandemic continues to take its toll on the UK economy with two major employers announcing substantial job cuts. Up to 1,800 jobs are under threat at the McDonald Hotels chain, which has 31 properties across the UK. Deputy Chairman Gordon Fraser said there was no realistic prospect of returning to normal trading in the foreseeable future as the tourism and leisure industry continues to lobby for a greater easing of lockdown measures. Take responsibility by adhering to the recommended measures. You can find the latest guide on the NCDC website as the centre continues to work closely with states. Setting up treatment centres, training healthcare workers to manage COVID-19 patients to recovery. It says also that wear a mask on your face, not your chin. It has no value under your chin. The World Health Organization has the on the global response to the COVID-19 strategy. Their website guides the public health response at both national and subnational levels with practical guidance for strategic action. ChannelsTV.com, our website, has more updates. You can find the latest on the pandemic in Nigeria across the world, plus other stories. That's ChannelsTV.com. That's the COVID-19 update. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antoine Stay healthy.